guess we'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Bob Stiegel. I'm here representing myself. I know some of the faces here. I hope to get to know some more of you. Uh, today I'd like to talk about allocator awareness, uh, the property of the containers in uh, C, modern C++. And uh, I initially titled this talk, uh, Testing the Limits of Allocator Awareness. And uh, once I started thinking about how I, how I was going to test containers, I realized that the state space of possible things that could be tested was so vast that a better title would be Testing the Lower Limits of Allocator Awareness. Uh, you know, my wife has this unreasonable expectation that I should work for a living and bring home money instead of working on C++ all the time. So that also uh, contributed to it. Uh, and I had, do have to say, after yesterday in David's talk, uh, visiting the platonic world of ideal mathematical forms and Odin's talk on inside-out template metaprogramming and Jackie's talk on reflection and uh, watching John's uh, dancing animations, uh, I'm feeling a little, uh, a little insecure because I'm only talking about C++14 here, so uh, bear with me. There is quite a bit of code in this, although I will say that it, every piece of code that you're going to see is actually small chunks of very simple code. There's just quite a bit of it, and hopefully it will all make sense to you uh, when we get through it. So, overview, outline. I'd like to talk, I'll briefly mention a couple of motivating problems as to why this is an interesting topic to me. I'll give some, a little bit of background uh, on allocators, uh, ancient and modern allocators. I think probably everybody in this room is familiar with all the major ideas, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about that. I am going to spend quite a bit of time talking about building the test suite, which I then use to do some performance testing of what I call synthetic pointers. I call them synthetic pointers because fancy is not fancy enough of a word for them, I think. So instead of fancy pointers, I call them synthetic. Uh, I get an extra syllable there. Uh, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the conformance of how uh, containers in uh, eight uh, modern compilers fare. In other words, do they actually fulfill the requirements of being uh, allocator aware? And when we get to the last few sides and I show you some tables of the results that I found, there were some very pleasant surprises and also some unexpected unpleasant surprises. So I'm trying to build a little bit of suspense there so you'll stay to the end. Okay. So motivation, motivation. All right. Problem number one, motivating example. Shared memory database. Um, I worked at VeriSign a few years ago and uh, there's a shared memory database that's used to do DNS resolution. And in, it's interesting in that you've got a bunch of memory segments that have been allocated in shared memory. And say I have process P1 and process P2, and they get mapped into well, what I call backbone arrays in each, in each process. Now, as part of this shared memory database, I've got some sort of indexing structure. In this case, I've tried to make something that looks like a tree. Now, in process P1, uh, the addresses that I've made up here, I might get some nice regular sequence of numbers, right? Uh, I might, each segment might have an address that's 100 higher than the, than the previous one. Well, these are very small segments in this example. But in process two, the operating system is under no requirement whatsoever to map a given segment to the same address in all processes. So the question becomes, I've got this thing that looks like a tree. I want to use pointers to implement this tree, and I want to use natural pointer syntax. How can I do that? Because this pointer, my, my root pointer, is going to mean, I want it to mean the same thing in both processes, but there could be different numerical values that represent the pointer. How can I create a pointer that's independent of, of the address space in which it resides? Problem number one. Problem number two. What I call a, a self-contained DOM, and this actually is something that applies to my current position. Let's pretend that this is some meaningful document object model and that I have implemented it using uh, an ordered set, and I'm picking an ordered set here. Uh, because it's a, it's a tree and it's part of the standard library. It's a red-black binary tree. It's part of the standard library. 
Well, what I would like to be able to do is create this self-contained data structure wherein I've got the parts that represent the object, the, uh, the message type, if you will, and then behind it is my heap. So I have, I have, a, I have a placement constructed my object in the front of this string of bytes. I have an allocator that points to the next byte after my object, and I use that as a heap. And I want to construct this stuff in my heap, and I want all my invariants inside that thing to hold. After I've done that, you know, this, I may have a pointer to it in one process, and I've called this, this thing P tree, and it's an address 4096. Well, I may write it to a disk, or I may send it to some, somebody somewhere else, and when they map it into their address space, it's at a different address, right? But I want it to all work. I want the receiver to be able to get a pointer to the beginning of the object and then be able to use it. I don't want to do any sort of iteration to serialize. I don't want to do any sort of parsing to deserialize. I just want to use memcopy, send, write, fwrite as serialization, and memcopy, receive, read, fread as deserialization. How can I do that? So those are my motivating examples. Okay, a little bit of background on allocators. When I first encountered STL and allocators some 23 years ago, after thinking about it, I thought the idea of allocators was absolutely brilliant. It was brilliant because it abstracted away from the containers the details that are necessary for, for managing memory. Uh, importantly, at the time, 1992, 93, 94, when Meng Li and, Stepan and Alexander Stepanov were developing the STL, they were concerned about hiding the memory model. Remember, at that time, you know, the big dominating operating system was DOS, and we had Windows 3.x on <coughs> DOS, and it was a 16-bit operating system running on 32-bit hardware, and we had segment offset addressing. 32-bit computing on the desktop hadn't really come about yet because Windows 95 hadn't been, been released, and uh, there was the whole Mac next thing going on, and you know who knew what was going to happen with that? So there was this, you know, this desire, I remember from reading in the news groups at the time, to sort of hide those details, and the thinking was that allocators could do that. And uh, to uh, emphasize a point that John made the other day, uh, Allocators perform a, another important uh, uh, task in that they separate allocation from construction and they separate destruction from deallocation. They do four separate things. You allocate, construct, destroy, deallocate. And that's important for containers. Uh, containers don't need to understand the allocation strategies behind the allocator. They don't need to understand the low-level details of how addressing works. They obtain the services of an allocator through parameterization. The allocator is a template parameter. Importantly, containers can work with chunks of raw bytes and construct and destroy objects when it makes sense for them to do that. They know that I'm going to get some raw bytes from the allocator. I don't care how he gives it to me, but now I've got some bytes. I can construct my objects. I can do whatever I need to. I can destroy my objects, my elements when I'm done. I can give them back to the allocator. He handles the dirty details. From my perspective, uh, as a young uh, engineer at the time, I thought this was really cool. So here is uh, a slightly abbreviated declaration of stood allocator from C++03, right? We've got, and actually the standard defines it as a class with a public section. I've defined it as a struct to save a little bit of vertical space. But we've got these type defs that, that abstract out details. And the ones that I'm most interested in are the pointer and const pointer. Those are the things that were supposed to allow you to abstract out the details of addressing, how addresses were computed, right? It makes sense. You would think by looking at this that I could make some other kind of allocator type and I could have type def foobar putter of t equals pointer, right? And you would think, hey, that ought to work. 
And we'll get to us in a second to why that actually never worked. And we've got a rebinder here uh, that allows a container to take an allocator type and rebind it to another type. And the, the canonical example there is a linked list. It, you, you know, std list is std list of t, comma, allocator of t. But lists don't allocate t's, they allocate nodes that contain t's. So the allocator of t actually gets rebound internally to an allocator of list node of t. And that's why the rebind exists. And here's our important, four important functions for allocate, deallocate, construct, and destroy. So this is great, makes perfect sense, ought to work. It doesn't. So here's a load of verbiage from the old standard. And I've highlighted the important sections here. And I think, and I don't know because I'm not a member of the committee and I was not at that time, I think that they started thinking about the issues and, and decided we've got to get a standard out, we're just going to punt for now. And, and why have they punted? Well, it's because they have allowed the implementers of containers to assume that all instances of a given allocator type are interchangeable. They always compare equal. What does that mean about the allocator? The allocator is stateless, number one. Number two, those type deft nested members that I just showed you, the, the uh, container implementer is allowed to assume that, that a pointer is a T star and that a const pointer is a const T star. They're just allowed to assume that. And guess what? They all did, which meant that inside of containers, uh, containers were actually implemented. Uh, a lot of declarations of the types inside of containers at the time didn't even use pointer, they just used T star. Now, they did insert some weasel words here that said, well, we'd like to encourage library implementers to do more. And it took a long time, I think, before uh, library implementers did. So, this led to the fact, oh, sorry, I've got another slide here, just sort of a, a, a quick and dirty mental picture. So, Allocators obtain their allocator serv allocation services from their template argument via uh, calling the allocate uh, member function. Uh, and that's what this, uh, uh, that's what this uh, uh, diagram is intended to convey, that the, the dashed arrow means I'm using this. I know it's not UML or any recognized form of uh, diagramming, but that's what it means. And again, the containers were allowed to assume that a pointer was a T star and a const pointer was a T star, which is the most important thing for this talk. And also that two, alloc two instances of allocator, some allocator type, were always equal. So the implications for this was that the standard containers of the time did not have to support synthetic pointers. <coughs> they did not have to support stateful allocators. And this also meant that there's a large class of interesting problems that could not be solved using the standard containers. Uh, the shared memory database example, uh, arena allocation, uh, per thread allocation, or per object private allocation, which is what I was trying to get at with my second motivating example there of the, the, Im the embedded DOM. Sure. While the compiler vendors didn't have to do it as a quality of implementation, they could do it. The thing is you could take advantage of it, but not portably, which made it really bad. In other words, if one vendor did it, they'd have a better implementation. There's nothing stopping vendors from doing it. Right. But they didn't do it initially, but more and more did. They started to after, I, I really, you know, uh, my impression, and I don't have any hard data, is that at, starting around the 2002, 2003 time frame, that, you know, vendors did start to change over, but initially, you know, the 97, 98, 99 time frame, nobody did it. Of course, <laughs> compilers were extremely primitive at the time as well. So, um, so now after C++11, which is, you know, just the greatest thing, those offending paragraphs that we just saw in the standard were deleted. And I'm sure there were a lot of people, I think there was a, I think there was a, a, a writing where, uh, uh, was Pablo? Yeah. Uh, had uh, made some little comment in there about you know how happy he was that 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 they it was gone the weasel words are gone that's right so 
several new requirements were added to the standard to improve allocators. And I'm just going to mention a few of them here, and I'm, I'm listing their tag names so that you can look them up. There's nullable pointer dot requirements. This, is, this specified the requirements for a synthetic pointer or what the standard calls a pointer-like type that supports null values. It has to compare with the null pointer. Uh, allocator dot requirements, it defines what an allocator is and also its relationship to this new thing called allocator traits, which was not in the old standard. There's pointer dot traits, a new thing which describes a uniform interface to pointers and pointer-like types. Very cool. There's allocator dot traits, which is, again, it's a new thing. It describes a uniform interface to allocator types. And the idea of pointer traits and allocator tra traits is that they provide a normalized layer that can be used by the containers. There's allocator adapter, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk, and this describes scoped allocator adapter. And it, it uh, is something that provides for deep propagation of allocators uh, uh, in the containers. So an outer container can pass its container to inner containers and so on and so forth if you have a nested hierarchy of containers. I'm not going to discuss that in this talk. Finally, there's container.requirements.general, which defines what it means to be an allocator-aware container. Now, <coughs> these things are spread all over the standard. Uh, they're not in one place. So you sort of, if you want to read the standard and look for them, you have to search the, the PDF by the tag name. Uh, and also, individually, each container has a sentence or two in it that says it must support uh, the container allocator aware requirements. Sorry, yes? Well, the allocator equivalents went away too at that time? Or, or you said they had to be equal? That has gone away. Good. Yes, uh, the question was, did the equivalence of allocators go away? And yes, the requirement that all allocators compare, all allocators instances of given type compare equal went away. We can now have stateful allocators. So here's another little, you know, Bob's diagramming method picture of what things look like today. I've got my allocator aware container of some type T and some customized allocator. But, uh, and by allocator aware container, I mean one of the standard containers, not my container. I'm just picking allocator aware as a, a, as a generic name. It could be vector or list or something like that. It gets its picture of of memory from allocator traits. Allocator traits normalizes all the information from pointer traits and from allocator so that the allocator aware containers only see one picture of everything else. So does that make sense to everybody? And uh, the cool thing about the allocator traits and pointer traits templates is there's some metaprogramming magic behind them. Uh, they are able to provide defaults for uh, nested types and uh, nested types and and functions that are expected to be provided uh, by the allocator if they're not there. So if if my custom allocator does not have a construct function, allocator traits will provide one. If my if my allocator does have a construct function, then that's the one that gets used. Okay, so. I'm not going to talk about allocators now. I'm going to talk about allocator traits because, you know, he's the new king of the block. So, very similarly to before, we've now got a set of uh, nested type defs. Um, the important things here from the perspective of this talk are allocator type, pointer, and const pointer. And we've also got these I'll come to in a second. Now, the cool thing is, is that what I mean there by choose is that through that template metaprogramming, allocator traits figures out what type that ought to be. Uh, for std allocator, the type of pointer will be T star. For the examples I'm going to show you in a few minutes, the type of pointer is something I, I call sinputter, sinputter brackets T. Now, so it's actually provides that information to the containers. The containers no longer assume that a pointer is a T star, the containers assume that a pointer is what you say it is. Now, we've also got these, these new things here. Uh, we've got these nested type defs called propagate on container assignment. I'm going to call it PACA. Propagate on container move assignment. I'm going to call that PACMA. Propagate on container swap. I'm going to call that POCS. 
and another one called is always equal. Now, in that case, choose is either stood false type or stood true type. And allocator traits decides what to make those what to make those type, nested type defs based on what your allocator says they are. So if I want my allocator to propagate when a container is copy assigned, in other words, I want the allocator itself to be copied, then in my allocator, I set prop, I, I define a nested type def, propagate on container copy assignment, and I type def that to be true type. And that will work its way down to the container, and in the container, it will say, oh, you know, for this allocator, I need to copy, uh, for this allocator type, I need to copy the allocator instance when I'm doing a copy assignment. And likewise with move assignment and container swap. This is what now allows containers to be stateful. Uh, or stateless, depending on what combination of arguments are chosen for those three type defs. And at the end, you'll see I ran some tests where I, I implemented, I instantiated containers for all possible values of that that make sense and was able to determine whether or not, you know, uh, containers did the right thing or crashed. And there were some containers that actually crashed for some combinations of arguments. Are you saying that all combinations of these things are, are viable, or are you saying... There are some combinations of things which are... They're allowed, but the, the implementations fail? There is... So if you have... If you have propagate on container swap uh, is <coughs> false, and your containers or, or your allocators compare unequal, that's undefined behavior. Because in a swap, the standard requires that after swap, all iterators remain valid. But if my allocators compare unequal and I need to swap, I cannot maintain the validity of my allocators. So that's an instance where it's a combination that leads to undefined behavior. Does that make sense? I, I guess so, but you, you can, if you have, uh, they don't always compare equal, but, but uh, it, it does, it does uh, propagate on swap. As long as the allocators are in fact equal, it is defined behavior. Yes. So, so that's fine. Yes. What you're saying is if you try to swap unequal allocators... And pox is false. And, right, okay, okay. And pox is false, yes. Yes, it's undefined behavior. That's, that's, right, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Arthur. I guess either that question or the question I have after hearing that question is, so there are like three cases, right? It's like, you do something that makes sense and it works. You do something that makes sense, but it doesn't work because of the load in the implementation. Yes. Or you do something that just plain doesn't make sense. So, sense. for the testing that I did, I ignored the case where the behavior was undefined because the standard says it's undefined and I'm not going to worry about testing something that's undefined. Did you ever have a case where the copy assignment was set to yes, propagate on copy? Yes. Assignment. Yes. Did you ever find a situation where that was a good idea? Well, in in what I did was test the, was or, right. whether it worked or not, the, the, not whether it was a good idea. Fair enough. The committee came up with the you know the cross product of all things, but we knew the propagating on assignment was a bad idea. It's like copying the virtual table to something else. Right. What are you doing? So, um, let's see. So also we've got a couple we've got uh, a couple of different rebinders. Uh, uh, the important one here is rebinding traits for different allocator types. Uh, and uh, the <coughs> second half, the bottom half. Well, by the way, just as a notational convention, uh, usually when I'm breaking classes up uh, code up <laughs> over slides, I th I throw in ellipses to make it clear that I'm continuing. So hopefully that comes through. So we've got allocate, deallocate, construct, and destroy, which are what we would expect them to be. We've got this new weird function, which has <laughs> got this incredibly long name, select on container copy construction. And this is a function that gets used by containers in one circumstance and one circumstance only. And that is called by the copy constructor in standard library containers. So what happens is... Uh, when copy constructing, uh, we'll see some code, but what, when copy constructing another container, the, the destination container has to know 
do I default allocate a new container or am I supposed to copy the allocator from my source? And allocator traits provides that uh, information to the container. And I've got a, a short example of source code that will show how that works. So what are the implications of, of the new allocator aware containers? Well, for stood library users, really almost nothing at all. Uh, if you recompiled your old stuff with new C++14, you probably didn't really notice any difference, at least any difference that was due to allocators. For allocator implementers, you now have to consider the question of how does my allocator supposed to behave in five different use cases? Copy and move assignment, uh, copy and move construction, and swap. And for library implementers, they had to adapt the standard containers accordingly to do the right thing in those five cases. So really the questions they had to answer are uh, how and when are, how are my allocator members to be constructed and when are allocator members replaced? So let's make up a fictional container. You know, here's my container. I've got my, uh, my value type, which is T. I've got my, I've typed def my allocator. I've got my allocator traits which are parameterized in terms of my allocator type now. Uh, I've pulled out my pointer and my const pointer. Uh, you know, I've defined some iterators. And I've got my, my special member functions. I've got my copy constructors. Uh, or these are the functions of interest for this talk. The copy constructor, the move constructor, uh, copy and move assignment operators, and swap. And let's pretend that uh, I've got something, a bunch of things called rep types, and I've just got this sort of monolithic representation of my container's guts, and I've got an instance of the allocator. So, what do I do in those five circumstances? So, for copy construction, uh, for the copy constructor, which just takes a, a reference to the source object, this is when I call select on copy, uh, select on container copy construction. This thing tells my container, am I copying the allocator from this guy or am I default constructing it? In the other form of the copy constructor, where I've explicitly provided an allocator object, I just go ahead and, and copy construct the allocator, which you can see in the initialization list there. And that, then after that, let's pretend I have a function called assign from, which takes iterator arguments, which I use then to to uh, iterate over the elements of the other container and build this container. So this is all, this is pretty straightforward. Um, yes? I'm just confused, like, why, why is allocator, why is there a special function like select on container copy? Why, why is it not always copy? Uh, you may not, if it's, if it's a stateless allocator, you may not need to copy it, or if it's a stateful allocator, you may not want to copy it. Uh, if you, I suppose if you had a, an allocator that was private to an instance of an object, you might not want that allocator to be copied in the other object. You might, you would want it to build its own private allocator. So when you use an example where an allocator is a private member of an object, aren't they? I, that's well, if you wanted to have an, if you for some reason wanted to have an allocator which existed, I'm sorry, um, say, what was the question again, John? Okay. So, we definitely have local tools for node-based containers. Right. We don't call them allocators because they're not general purpose things. In other words, if you have a, a, an adaptive tool for, say, a, an unordered container, right, or an unordered set, the, you'll have that built in, but it would be fed by an allocator that's a general purpose allocator, but the, but the tool knows how big the chunks are that it's going to be putting out. Right. So when, when you say an allocator inside the object, you wouldn't do that typically. You would you would build the data structure that you need, and an allocator is a general purpose data structure. Right. So the question was, what's a good example of why a container would have a private uh, allocator rather than using a general purpose allocator and managing pools of memory internally? And I'm afraid, off the top of my head, I can't give you a, a good example at the moment. And I can't give you a good example either. So. Okay. Uh, well, con conceivably, if you had if you had a pool of memory and have some hardware. An object modeling that hardware that would be private, and then if you wrote another card, another piece of hardware, it would have its own separate pool. Okay. So the comment was, if you had a pool of memory that was in hardware, that could potentially be private to uh, uh, an instance of a container, and 
not necessarily copyable to another container, you would want that other container to use another pool of memory from hardware. Am I getting that right, Charlie? Yes. Okay. I think I came up with an, an answer to my question. You showed a slide earlier in, on where you had some stuff, you had an allocator, and then you had the memory board as part of the same slide. Yeah, sure. And I think that that might, I've, I've not done it, I liked it, I forgot that I liked it, but I liked it. Okay. And it sounds to me like you could put an instance of either a monotonic or a multi-pool allocator right there. Yes, yes. And in fact, the monotonic allocator might be the win if you're just going to build it up and then leave it. Exactly. Excellent. Arthur. Think that useful behavior would be status assert. Um, like, you know, I've, I've got this pool of memory, it's associated with this vector. I don't want someone just creating a copy of this vector and then aliasing my pool of memory. Okay. okay. All right, I need to, sp need to speed up a little bit here. Okay, so copy assignment. I want to fly through these next things so I can get to the test suite, which is really where the bulk of the code and sort of the interesting ideas are, I think. So, in terms of copy assignment, what we really want to do, and this is pseudocode, this is not literal C++ code, I've taken out all the template verbiage, and uh, obviously I can't do this kind of a c comparison, but what I want to do is if, I, if propagate on container assignment is true, uh, and my containers are not equal, then I want to clear my elements and deallocate the memory, I want to copy my allocator, and then I want to assign my elements. Fairly straightforward case, right? Everybody see the logic behind that? Okay. I'll take silence as assent. Okay, move assignment. Now this is the trickier, this is a trickier situation. Um, so really what we're doing in this case is we're looking to see, do I propagate on move assignment? And if I do propagate on move assignment, then <coughs> I can clear and deallocate the memory for all of my elements. I can, I can move my allocator from the, from, the, from the source into the destination, into this, and I can move my rep, my internal representation, from the source into this. That's the easiest case. The next easiest case is, okay, I'm not, I'm not moving my allocator, but my allocators are equal. Since my allocators are equal, I'm going to clear and deallocate my memory, and I'm going to move my elements from the source into the destination. And I know I can do that because my allocators are equal. If my allocators compare equal, that means uh, allocation and construction in one container, the, the same memory can be destroyed and deallocated in another container, right? The last case is if I don't propagate on move construction and my allocators compare unequal. In that case, what I need to do is move elements individually. And that's not this is not guaranteed to be a no-throw operation. You could throw exceptions, and there could be allocations and deallocations involved in this. There's no move operations going uh, happening as there are in the first two cases. This is very much like copy assignment, except I'm doing move assignment. I'm moving element by element from the source into the target. Yes? Just a question. Um, maybe I missed something. Why in the first case you don't compare all the uh, Because I've said, I, I've said explicitly in this traits, uh, preserve on container move assignment. That trait explicitly says, when I'm doing a move assignment, you must move the allocator. <coughs> right? Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, swap. Swap is a little simpler than move assignment. Uh, here, if my preserve on uh, container swap is true type, then I know that I can swap the representation and I'm going to swap the allocators. Now, if my trait is false, but my allocators are equal, Similar to move assignment, I'm going to swap. I know I can swap the reps in that case because the, because the allocators are equal. And John, this is what I was getting at. This is the last case. This is undefined behavior because now I cannot guarantee after the swap that my iterators are still valid. That's undefined behavior. 
Okay, a little bit behind, but building the test suite. So what is it that I want to test? The space of testable things here is vast. When I thought about the problem, given my ape's brain, I thought about it in two dimensions. Pointer type and stateless versus stateful. I can have ordinary and synthetic pointers, I can have stateless allocators and stateful allocators. Now, where does the standard fit on this chart? Well, that's where std allocator occupies that space. std allocator is defined such that all can, that, that it is a, all of the pocs are true and that it, all instances of, uh, of a given type of std allocator compare equal. And it uses ordinary pointers. So I want to explore the rest of this chart. And that's what I attempted to test. So there was a lot of things I could do. I decided to confine my efforts to measuring the performance of synthetic pointers because, because I got questions about performance at my talk last fall at CPPCon, and also basic conformance tests of the containers themselves. Do they actually compile and do they run? Do they run without crashing? And if they run without crashing, do they give me the right results? So I decided to confine the scope of the testing to a small number of algorithms for pointer performance tests. I couldn't think of a good typical case for pointer performance tests, but I thought if I used things like copy sort or stable sort, I could put an upper bound on the bad behavior of the pointers. I could try and figure out what's the worst case performance that my synthetic pointers are going to create. And hopefully in the real world, your performance would be better than this worst case. It was hard for me to think of anything really that uses more pointer operations than sort. And also, I wanted to test a, a sub, I tested a subset of containers and the strings uh, for conformance testing. Now, uh, I want to make uh, two quick notes, uh, comments about this. I only tested map and unordered map. I didn't test, you know, set, un, uh, set multi-set, uh, multi-map, because they all use the same underlying RB tree. The same thing for, for the unordered containers. They all use the same un, uh, underlying implementation. So I didn't see the need to create six, six additional test functions. And the reason that I've put a, a star here on string is interestingly enough, in the, contain, in the standard, at least in the 2014 standard, the string is not considered to be a container and the string is not subject to the allocator awareness requirements, which is kind of interesting. It, I actually found that it does fulfill it in a lot of cases, but there's no requirement for it to. So that's that's the reason for the asterisk there. I think it's a bug in the standard, actually. Essentially, string optimization wouldn't necessarily be possible with full container semantics. We have short string optimization and we fully allocate it. So the comment was that the short string optimization may preclude the need for or the ability to uh, implement the allocator uh, aware requirements. The problem is that your short string optimization move may invalidate uh, iterators because you have to copy your, your string is under whatever inheritance. Right. So the comment is is that with the short string operation, uh, short string optimization move. Uh, potentially invalidates iterators. Did I get that right? Okay. Okay, so how do I define success? Well, pretty straightforward. Compilation and linking succeeds. I can build. I can run tests without crashes, hangs, or infinite loops, which I've encountered. My synthetic pointer performance yields the same results as ordinary pointers. Uh, uh, that my container conformance tests uh, when I use test alligator, allocators of some type T, give me the same results as those containers using std allocator of T. And also, something that's near and dear to my heart, is that the containers support relocation. Can I take, can I use a synthetic pointer that points to a piece of memory somewhere? Can I relocate the memory and continue to use the container? And I think the ability to do that is actually implied by the allocator aware container requirements. And we'll find, in most cases, that works, but there's a surprising case where it does not. So how am I going to build the tests? Well, uh, I'll get in a few seconds to talk about how certain aspects of allocator design can be viewed as policy types, and I'm going to reuse some work from prior talks. I'm going to sort of rush through this a little bit. 
So when I think about memory allocation, I think there are sort of six concepts, concept with a little c, and I've divided them into two broad categories. Structural management, which is composed of the addressing model, the storage model, the pointer interface, and the allocation strategy. And then there's concurrency management, which I think of as being thread safety and transaction safety. The addressing model, you can think of this as being a policy type that implements primitive addressing operations. It's analogous to a void pointer. It's convertible to a void pointer. Internally, this model, in its representation, it defines the bits, the pattern of bits that are used to represent an address. It defines how an address is computed from those pattern of bits, and it, by its address computations, it implies how it expects memory to be arranged. So you can represent the addressing model by an ordinary void star or by some sort of synthetic pointer or fancy pointer which emulates a void star. The next concept is that of the storage model, and this is a policy type that manages segments. And I'm using the word segment here instead of blocks or super blocks or mega blocks or, you know, the word block is completely over, uh, overloaded too much. So I use the term segments. So the storage model interacts with an external source of, of memory to borrow and return segments. And here I'm defining a segment as a region of memory that's been provided to the storage model by some external source, the OS, right? Um, it provides an interface to segments in terms of the addressing model, and it's the lowest level of, uh, of allocation. It is, in a sense, the deepest and lowest backing allocator. So, what are some sources of segments? Well, you've all, you all know what these are. Break, S-break, M-map, uh, the Windows functions, virtual alloc and heap alloc for, for private memory on Unix and Windows. We've got Shimget and Shimat for System 5 uh, shared memory. There are also POSIX shared memory calls. And then there are the, the file mapping calls from Windows for managing shared memory. These are sources of segments, right? This is what, this is what the storage model manages, is these segments of raw memory. Now, in order to actually use this raw memory, we need a pointer interface. We need something that takes the addressing model and puts type information on top of that. And that's what I call the pointer interface. It's a, you can think of it as a policy type that wraps the addressing model to emulate a pointer. It is analogous to a T star. It provides enough pointer syntax for the containers to do their job. It's convertible in the right direction to ordinary pointers, uh, you know, from derived to base or adding CV qualifiers. It's convertible in the right direction to other uh, pointer interface types. And of course, it can be represented by a T star, a natural pointer, or it can be represented by a synthetic pointer that exhibits the right set of properties. And I'm actually going to show you some code as to how you can actually implement this, and it, it behaves as closely to a natural pointer as can be done. The next concept uh, is the allocation strategy. This is the policy that manages the process of allocating memory for clients. This is the guy that takes a segment and divides it into chunks, adds some type information to those chunks, and hands them off to a client. This is John's Arena Allocator. John's Arena Allocator is what I think of, and I don't mean to uh, ascribe any labels to your work that don't apply, but it is an allocation strategy. The, the algorithms that you use to allocate memory, each of those is a different allocation strategy. Right, there, there, were the, there are three different basic kinds, which is monotonic, multi-pool, and the composite ones that are, that are in the standard. Uh, but, but the thing that differentiates, I think, a little bit is, in our model, there's no type associated with it. The allocation strategy is, give me this, you know, give me this. Yes. You ask for some, something to get it, and then it's up to the container to turn it into the type or whatever. Right. It's, you're asking for bytes for the allocation. That's the part that's a little different. There's no rebind or any of that stuff going on. Okay. okay. So the comment was is that John's uh, arena strategies are slightly different from mine in that the type information is bound at a different time. Right. The, the, the strategy of allocation has nothing to do with type. Whether I get an int or two shorts in a struct makes no difference to the allocation. Okay. So... Uh, 
the way it works, the way it works is when you're getting something from from a, 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 a monotonic allocator, the size is is a hint for alignment. So if you ask for two shorts or an inch, <clears throat> you're going to get a four byte align. But if you ask for three shorts, you might get a okay. two byte align. Thank you. You, you can declare a pipe to be more aligned than a shorter. Right, but, but, but I, okay. Fair okay. Enough. Sorry, I have to cut you off. Okay. We're, we're halfway in, and I'm about a third of the way into the material here. So the allocation strategy, I think of it as being analogous to malloc and free or global operator new, global operator delete. Uh, the last two concepts, thread safety and transaction safety, uh, uh, you know, thread safety, uh, making sure that your allocator works correctly in a multi-threaded environment. Transaction safety is something that you have to worry about if you're working on, you know, databases that have to meet ACID requirements. I'm not really going to say very much more about them. Uh, this is the mental picture I have. Uh, you've sort of got four concepts that build upon each other that are structural. You've got these concurrency ideas which can interact with the structural ideas at any level depending on how you design it. Uh, thread safety and transaction safety are, you know, beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, how do I characterize stood allocator by this framework? Well, the addressing model is void star. The storage model is whatever global operator new does under the covers. The pointer interface is T star. The allocation strategy is, again, whatever global operator new does under the covers. Thread safety is whatever global operator new does under the covers to ensure uh, uh, that there are no data races. And there is no transaction safety associated with stood allocator. Right? It would not be appropriate for use unless with, without some uh, lot of wrapping in, in something that had to be transaction safe. One last comment. There are a lot of other allocators that we've all heard of. Uh, to my way of thinking, they all have the same addressing model. They all have the same pointer interface. Where they really seem to differ is in the details of how they implement their storage model, their allocation strategy, and their strategies for thread safety. Uh, can I describe what transaction safety means in this context? Yes. Is my allocation, can I consider my allocation to be a transaction? After I've allocated memory and I've done something on it, can I then commit it? Or can I roll back the allocation? How is that different from distributions? We can take it offline. That's a very long discussion. Could I ask about thread safety quickly? Yes. Thread safety for a global allocator in a multi-threaded environment is required, obviously. And by thread safety, you mean that I could have two concurrent accesses to the allocator and they'll be, they'll be uh, yes. serialized. Okay. So, so the question was, uh, uh, what does thread safety mean in this context? And to summarize quickly, it means no data races. That, that the, well, you said custom, and that's what I'm trying to understand. Well, what I mean here is that these vendors that have created these other allocators, they implement their thread safety in a customized way. Well, the way it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not optional to have thread safety. Right. What I'm saying, it's none how of those things are optional. What custom means on that slide is they they've do. done those things differently. Okay. All right. All right. So, synthetic pointer performance testing. All right. So here I'm going to move into one box of the chart and trying to measure the performance of, of uh, synthetic <laughs> pointers. So I'm going to show you some test framework types. Uh, at the, the first type, you know, sorry, uh, right, all right. So the first two types are the, the test allocator that I've created. RHX is the relocatable heap experimental allocator. It's parameterized in terms of a type, an element type T. And AS is the allocation strategy. Uh, uh, by the way, I should say, by way of explanation, I'm, I'm going to do top down, and then I'm going to build code from the bottom up. So at the top of the level is the allocator, which is a wrapper. It wraps what I call the leaky allocation strategy. John would call it a monotonic allocator. His name is much cooler than mine. But it's also called that in the standard. Uh, I have defined a type called SynPutter, which uh, is a synthetic pointer. It is parameterized in terms of a type T. Uh, 
and an addressing model, which is represented by the parameter AM there. I have created a storage model base class. This thing allocates a big segment of memory and then provides different views of it to different types. And then I've created five different customized pairs of addressing model and storage models. So, uh, for example, I've got the wrapper storage model, the 2D extra large, 2D, 1D, and offset storage model. And, I, you know, I sort of racked my brain and thought, well, these are the five different kinds of synthetic pointers I can think of, you know, under pressure. So, uh, each addressing model uh, is used by the storage model. The wrapper storage model is derived from the storage model base class, which provides the storage that the wrapper model can use, uh, the wrapper addressing model, to, to build its picture of memory. <coughs> Hopefully it'll be a little more clear from the code. Okay, so starting from the top down, the, the allocator, pretty straightforward, same type defs we saw before. To keep things simple, I'm taking all the POC arguments and setting them to true type. Uh, here, pointer and const pointer, I'm pulling them out of the allocation strategy by using a rebinder, and this is where I get my synthetic pointer from that's going to be used for testing. Uh, and then the, the standard, the usual member functions. This is not the minimal allocator interface. I actually wanted to, inter, uh, to look at address and construct and destroy and sort of play with how they worked. Uh, so, so how does it work? How does allocate work? Well, if you remember, I've got my allocation strategy is a member of my allocator. I call it mheap. So, very simple. I allocate some bytes and I cast it to my pointer type and I return that pointer. Very simple. Uh, very similar with, uh, with the deallocate. Construct exactly what you'd expect it to be. And exactly, this is actually the, the, the expression for constructing in an allocator that the standard requires. And destroy. Very straightforward, exactly what you would expect them to be. Allocation strategy. My allocation strategy is parameterized in terms of the storage model. Remember, the storage model is the guy that hands me my big segments of memory. These are the non-standard parts. Uh, these are the different pieces that I built in such a way that they could be composed as template arguments so I didn't have to you know, cut and paste a lot of code. So my allocation strategy uses a storage model. Uh, from the storage model, it obtains the addressing model and you know integer types that it needs. It provides memory to the allocator in terms of a void pointer type. The allocator type takes my void pointer type and casts it to a typed uh, synthetic pointer. And then I've got functions for allocating and deallocating. I've got a function called reset buffers, which just wipes everything. I've got a function called swap buffers, which I use for testing relocation. We'll see how that works uh, in a bit. Uh, this uh, code, don't pay a lot of attention to it, but this is a very simple monotonic allocator. It just basically starts at the low water mark, keeps adding things with a, uh, uh, moving, up the, moving up the segment, uh, uh, modulo 16 bytes, handing out chunks. Uh, the important thing here is it returns a pointer the, the void pointer type uh, or the addressing model type that's provided by the that's specified by the addressing model. Question: When you said sixteen bytes, this is you're not trying to, to do any alignment. No, I'm just maximal alignment. Maximal alignment, sixteen bytes, and just cheap and dirty. The question was: I'm not doing anything with alignment, anything special with alignment. The answer is no. I'm just doing everything allocation size modulo sixteen bytes, just for simplicity. My deallocation is trivial, it's a no-op. Pointer interface. This is something I'm sort of proud of. Uh, here's an outline for what we're going to look at, and this is probably the most complex piece of code. Um, I'm attempting to emulate a real pointer, so I'm going to talk about the special member functions, other constructors, other assignment operators, conversions, dereferencing and pointer arithmetic, and uh, some helpers to support uh, library requirements and comparison operators and member date. So this is sort of an outline of what we're going to look at. Before we get there, I had to define some 
I had to use Sphene to define some helper traits. Because I want to use Sphene, I actually gave myself the challenge to be able to support void pointers, const void pointers, pointers, and const pointers in one class. So I had to manipulate the overload resolution set with Sphene to make that happen. Specifically, if my pointer is void, I don't want dereferencing operators or any of the pointer arithmetic operators. So I created some simple traits to help me do that. Uh, this trait uh, uh, ena enables, is used to enable if a pointer of type from is convertible to a pointer of type to, and then there's the logical converse of that trait, and we'll see why they're needed in a moment. Uh, there's a trait called is comparable, so that I can compare pointers to types using synthetic pointers where it makes sense to compare them. I, you know, you don't it normally would not compare, say, a, a pointer to int to a pointer to struct foo. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And I wanted to emulate that. I've got a type which these, uh, these types are used uh, for uh, modifying uh, the overload resolution set for the case where the pointer uh, is actually a void pointer. So I want to, uh, I want to enable something, uh, a member function, if the type is not void. And uh, this trait is used to just do a, a type calculation as part of the nested type defs, which we'll see in a moment. Okay, so what does it look like, the top of the, the synthetic pointer? Well, I've got a rebinder, which I need uh, for conversion operation. I'm using my addressing model to get my difference type, my, my size type. This is where I'm going to use the, the trait that I just defined to determine whether T is void or non-void. If T is void, then my reference is going to be set to void. Uh, if T is non-void, then reference is going to be whatever T is with a reference added to it. Uh, and I also have the pointer type def, which I sent to be to say that this is a pointer. Uh, and because I want to use this as a pointer, I have to tag it with a random access iterator tag so the standard algorithms will use it. My special member functions, uh, they're all default no accept. My use other, other uh, special member functions, uh, other constructors, I'm going to allow implicit conversion from an instance of an addressing model uh, from a null pointer. If, so I want to allow an implicit conversion from a U pointer if a U pointer is convert, if U star is convertible to T star. And again, if U star is convertible to T star, I want to allow an implicit conversion from a sin pointer of U to a sin putter of T. So that's how those traits are used to, to permit those kind of conversions. And if the conversion is not per permissible, those functions disappear from the overload resolution set. Uh, similarly with assignment, I allow assignment from null pointer. Uh, I allow assignment from uh, a U star or a sin putter of U if the operation is convertible. If the operation would make sense for U star to be assigned to T star, it's allowed. Otherwise, it's not. Oops. Similarly, with conversion, I've got an explicit operator, uh, explicit conversion to operator bool, which is actually implicit in things like if, while, and for statements, the so-called, I think they're called qualified conversion contexts. I allow an implicit conversion to a U star. In the same case, it would make sense for my T star type of my pointer to be convertible to U. In the case where it's not convertible to, to U, this is where I use the logical converse of that trait and make it explicit. So when do I use that? I use that if I'm casting from a sin putter of void to a sin putter of T, or from a sin putter of, uh, of a base to a sin putter of derived, right? The same instances where I would have to apply a static cast to a natural pointer. I wanted to emulate that here. Dereferencing, right? Now these are pointer operations that require uh, types. These don't work for void. So that's where this trait comes in. I only enable these operators if T is not void. And sort of the same principle applies for all of the pointer arithmetic operators. 
So is there anything else of interest here? Uh, yes, the last thing of interest here is this member function pointer two is something that's required by pointer traits to work correctly. Okay. All right, I'm going to skip the, uh, the source code for how these things are implemented. And by the way, I'm going to make all of this available. So I've got my storage model base class. This thing, as I mentioned, the storage model man manages segments. Uh, I've got functions that provide me the, the address of a given segment based on its index and, and some other functions that provide information that's used by the, the allocation strategy. Uh, importantly, this is how the, for this very simple, very simple storage manager, I've got an array of pointers to segments of memory that will be allocated. I've got an array of sizes and I've got an array of what I call shadow pointers, which are, will be what I call shadow segments. So what I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to implement a few different views of memory. So suppose I wanted to have a one-dimensional addressing view of memory. Well, I have a member called SM1D base, and I want to compute an address. I want to, if I had a one-dimensional pointer, I might want to just store a pointer, uh, an offset in it, and then to compute the address, I've got this static member who, whose value I know because it's, it's a static object. I can get it from any instance, and I want to add my offset to that to get an address inside my segment. Uh, I could have a two-dimensional addressing view where my pointer contains a segment index and an offset. So the same principle would apply. I've got some segment index which brings me here, uh, gets me the address here, I add an offset to it, and it takes me somewhere inside the segment. Very much like DOS, actually. Uh, and sort of the full picture of what this is, is I've got my segment pointers, my segment sizes, I've got shadow, shadow pointers, I've got segments and shadow segments, and then I've got these static objects uh, or static references which I'm going to use for, for one-dimensional indexing to provide a one-dimensional view. All right, I'm going to quickly go through the addressing models. So these are all very similar. Uh, they differ, the way they differ is in the way the addressing model object is created. <coughs> Each of these different types of storage model provide a sort of different view of memory, a different view of addressing uh, that's, that's used by the addressing model. The addressing models are actually the interesting things here. So, my wrapper addressing model. It's very, very simple. I've got a lot of special functions are all accept, no, no accept and default. Uh, I accept implicit conversion from null pointer and void pointer. And this is really where the rubber hits the road here. And I've got some helper functions for doing comparisons. So this is the interesting stuff right here. This is actually the heart of all of it. Functions for, the function that computes the address, functions that do assignment from other types of pointers, functions that do increment and decrement operations. Because this is a wrapper pointer, my internal implementation is just a void, right? So my functions, oops. Oh, I thought I had some source code for those here. No, I don't, jeez. All right, so, so let me just say, do some hand waving and say, in this case, the computation of an address is just returning the value of the pointer that's stored. That's the important thing here is how addresses are computed. So in my 2D extra large storage model, remember, I want to do two-dimensional addressing into a segment. So the, low, the, the important bits of the addressing model are that I'm going to store an offset and a segment, right? And so now, uh, when I compute an address, I get the address of the segment based on the segment uh, index, and I add the offset to it, and that's what I return as the, as the actual address. And, and I do a little, a little bit of cheating here to do increment and decrement operations. Uh, and there's a function which uh, assigns from an external pointer, it searches through the segments to determine whether or not 
The address lies in one of the segments. If it does, it computes the appropriate segment index and offset. Otherwise, uh, it does a little bit of, of uh, it, it treats it as though it's part of a universal segment. The based, the regu the, the based 2D model is also very similar to this. It's two-dimensional addressing. Uh, it's a little bit different representation though. Here I want to use eight bits for the pointer. I'm going to use the upper eight bits to, or the upper 16 bits, I'm sorry, to represent the segment index and the lower 48 bits to represent an offset. So here, as you can imagine, the, the computation of an address from the, from the uh, segment and offset is a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to take the upper 16 bits, which I, I, I specified in a union there, and that be, use that as the index to get my segment, and then I'm going to mask my offset mask with the offset, add the two to compute the address. A uh, little bit of bit twiddling there. Does that make sense to everybody? It's fairly straightforward bit operations. And again, finding, uh, uh, importing an external pointer. There's the one-dimensional addressing model. Remember, I want to treat the same segment as if it was one-dimensional rather than two-dimensional. Uh, so here, in the one-dimensional model, I'm just going to store the offset. And because I'm only storing the offset, there's only one segment that I can use. There's no way to figure out one segment, so which have more than one segment. So this assumes that I'm only using one segment of memory. So here, uh, the, addressing, the, the address computation is a little more complex uh, because I need to find a way to represent a null pointer. So I have something called the null offset, a special number. And if my offset is equal to null offset, then I assume that this represents a null pointer. Otherwise, I compute the address by getting the first the address of the segment that I'm using and adding the offset to it. What did you choose for the null offset? Uh, good question. I think I might have used negative one. Uh, what did I use for the null offset? I think I might have used a negative yes, negative one, special number. Okay. The offset storage model. This is actually kind of interesting, and this is I've, this is directly inspired by boost.innerprocess. Uh, I shamelessly plagiarized, if you will. Um, offset addressing. Suppose I have some segment and I have some string, and I've got two pointers, and they point to string. Uh, the way that offset addressing works is that the offset pointer stores the offset from the pointer itself to the thing it points to. So in this case, pointer 1 lives at address 8, and it stores an offset of 48, which takes it to my offset of my string. Pointer 2 lives at address 24 and stores an offset of 32. They both represent the address 56, but they have different internal values. It's kind of weird, right? But brilliant, but slow. But brilliant. So how do I compute the address? Well, you know, this is pseudocode, but you get the idea. I take the address of where the pointer itself is, and I add the offset that I store internally. Well, here, again, you have the question of how do I store the null pointer. So uh, in this case, the properties that I have is that the address of the thing that's pointed to by putter1 and putter2 is the same, but if I were to do a mem, comp a mem compare, the bits inside are different. Right? This is different than any of the other pointer types. So, here's the guts. I, instead of using unsigned types, which uh, I think the boost library does, I use, I use signed types because it's easier for me to read them in the debugger. Uh, I just don't do two's complement uh, arithmetic in my head very well. So, I have to represent something called the null offset. I picked the number one because that means that, uh, you know, I'm pointing one byte inside the address of, the, of, of this, which is something that's very unlikely that somebody's going to point to. I can't use zero because if my pointer is at the beginning of the list node and the list node has to point to itself, that's zero, and it's a legitimate, a legitimate <coughs> offset. So I have to have some helper functions. I've got a function that determines the offset between two addresses, and I've got two helpers that determine the offset between this object and some other thing. 
And the code is very simple, right? I mean, the offset between two things uh, is sort of a technicality here in that you're taking the, uh, the pointers and you're converting them to an input or T. Uh, and this assumes that your, your implementation supports input or T. And then subtracting to get the offset. And here, then to compute the offset between this object and something else, you know, I have to determine is the something else, does the something else represent the null offset? If it does, I'm going to store the null offset. If it doesn't, then I'm going to compute the offset between the address of this and the address of the other thing. And I'm going to add the other thing's offset to the offset that I'm computed. And if you think about it, draw a picture, it works. Uh, same sort of logic for the last member function there. So now, how do I compute my actual address? Well, to compute an address, again, I have to say, do I represent, am I storing the null offset? If I do, then I represent the null pointer. That's what I return. Otherwise, I'm going to take this thing that I store, this, I'm going to cast it into a uint putter, I'm going to add an offset to it, and I'm going to take that whole thing and I'm going to cast it back to a void, store, void star, and I'm going to return that. And <clears throat> this is the logic that Boost Inner Process uses. And, uh, uh, I can't find any, I can't find any faults in it. Uh, so, uh, to assign from another pointer, I ju can just call my offset to function that gets the offset from that thing to this. And, uh, you know, incrementing and decrementing is done just by incrementing and decrementing the offset that I store internally. However, my uh, assignment and construction are now different and they can't be trivial constructors or trivial assignment operators anymore because I actually have to execute code in the member initialization list. I have to actually figure out when I'm constructing this thing, even if I'm copy constructing it from another pointer, I have to run some code because now I have to, I have to juggle the offsets, right? Uh, same thing applies to assignment and, and, and move assignment operators. So, test suite. I've taken all of these things and I've created what I call, I've, I've uh, instantiated the leaky allocation strategy for each of those five models. And so I'm going to have five different, uh, five different synthetic pointer types. And so I have functions, parameterized functions to run copy tests, to run sort tests, to run stable sort tests. I've defined some macros here. Uh, where I stringize the names so I can print things out as I go along and I can see what's happening. Uh, I use four different types, uh, uint32, uint64, std string, and this thing, which is something I just wanted to fill with random numbers that takes, you know, a non-trivial <laughs> amount of time to copy and, and, and compare. So, uh, what does the testing look like? Well, excuse me. I run the copy tests, and here you're seeing I'm running them for the wrapper strategy. Those four lines are actually repeated four more times for the other four strategies. Same thing for sorts, same thing for stable sorts. So I've got uh, five times four times three. So I'm running 60 different test scenarios. And each one of those sorts is actually, or each one of those things is, uh, is done multiple times. Now I did want to make one note here about the copy tests. I originally ran these tests with std copy. And as it turns out, I got bad data from that. And the reason I got bad data from that is when I was, comp uh, it, will, it will turn things into mem copy that should be mem copied. And that doesn't help me because I wanted to understand what's the difference in speed between dereferencing and incrementing a pointer a natural pointer and a synthetic pointer. And when the compiler kicks in and says, oh, I can mem copy everything for you, I lose that information. So what I did, uh, this was a, a tagged implementation. I had one tagged for non-random access iterators. So the trick that I did to prevent the, op, uh, the optimization is I just had a static int. And inside my loop, I incremented the static so I wouldn't be optimized out. Arthur. No, it was correctly optimizing, but I didn't want the optimization because the optimization hid the time that I was trying to, to measure. So at least some of your synthetic, some of your synthetic pointers actually were handing out to regular old pointers that maybe you wanted to map. That's a master thing. Yes, but what I wanted to compare, I was comparing 
So um, I'm going to have to think about this offline. Uh, talk to me afterwards, and, and we'll, I'll explain why that happened. I, I'm going to have to look at the source code and refresh my memory. But anyways, I just wanted to note that I wasn't using std copy. I was using a customized version that made sure that even when I was uh, assigning a native pointer to a native pointer, it wasn't optimized out and becoming mem copy. All right, so five addressing models, four data types, 13 array sizes, a sort of a logarithmic or exponential uh, uh, size increase, 100, 200, 500. Take those three things, multiply them, or, or replicate them up to a million. Three different algorithms, copy, sort, stable sort, eight compilers, the three most recent GCCs, the three most recent Clangs, the two most recent Visual Studios. And this is the fun stuff. Here's the environment. This is my workstation at home, a Xeon 3690 with 24 gig of RAM, running Windows 8.1 for Visual Studio. I'm running VMware with a CentOS 7.2 VM, uh, 11, VMware 11.1 for GCC and Clang. Uh, I timed the operations with std chrono. Copy operations were similar to what John did in his tests, uh, were repeated so that a total of 10 million copies were done. So the copy test for a million elements was done 10 times. The copy test for 100,000 elements was done 100 times, and so on and so forth. Because I wanted to have enough time spent copying to be measurable and, and useful. Uh, all the sorting tests were performed 16 times. The highest three and lowest three times were dropped. Uh, so I had a total of 10 that worked its way into the average. All tests were done in a single thread. And finally, the results that I'm going to show you are ratios. And they're the time that it took for the operation with the sin putter to complete over the time that it took for a native pointer to complete. Right? Everybody got that? So, all right. I've got a lot of graphs here. All right. Clang 4.0. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, only going to I'm not going to show you the graphs for uint32 because it's kind of repetitive. Uh, so I'm going to show the graphs for uint64 for string and test struct. And uh, by the way, I should, I should qualify. Stood string in this case for, for these copy tests was constrained to be smaller than the size of the string so that they would only be small strings. I didn't want, to, I didn't want any uh, possibility of allocation or deallocation to interfere with the timing. So I purposely confined all of the strings in the copy tests to be, to be size of string uh, less zero to size of string minus eight. So, you know, zero to 24. It might be slightly above the threshold. Yeah, there's some overhead as well. I think it's at 21. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, well then. So uh, the comment was is that uh, my, I might have gone over the threshold for allocations, and, and I admit I might have. So anyways, uh, let's see. So in the graph here, we've got wrapper, 2D, extra large, 2D, regular 2D, 1D, and offset pointers. And you know, now I can see that the little tick marks are not as distinct as I, as I thought they would be. Uh, but we can see that the worst performer in this case, at least, is the offset pointer, right? So with the string copy operation, now we get more of a variance with, with Clang 4.0. For copying that test struct that I mentioned that's 64 bytes long, you get sort of a, a strange distribution here. Uh, for anything other than the wrapper pointer, they're, they're sort of slow at the beginning, and then uh, they all sort of converge to the same ratio uh, for larger numbers of array elements. And by the way, this is a, the ratio is the, on the left-hand side, and this, this is an exponentially growing scale uh, of the number of elements in the array uh, along the x-axis. Could you go back one just for a second? This one? Yeah. I don't know, but I have no idea. I've not investigated it, but I will tell you that is extremely consistent from run to run. So the question was, explain the peak and valley on this graph. And the answer is, I have no idea. But it was very consistent. Okay.
Uh, so, Clang, UNT64 sort. Okay, you know, this is very interesting. Now you can sort of see, uh, you can sort of see how, how things spread out, and I find interesting that, that uh, there's a larger spread, and then they sort of asymptotically converge in, in these two, two groups. But, you know, you're going to find, and this is very interesting, that the wrapper pointer performance was actually very slightly better than native pointer. And I saw that in a few cases where the wrapper pointer, for some reason, optimized better than native pointers. And then there were some cases that you would think that, well, you know, there should be no difference between the wrapper pointer and the native pointer, but the wrapper pointers were worse. I'm not going to try and divine, you know, how the compiler does its thing. So we see very similar uh, results for strings, for string sorting. And again, these are different numbers of strings in the array that are being sorted. The last is I'm sorting a million strings of whose values are randomly generated and regenerated for every run. It's not the same million strings in each run. Sorting the test struct, I defined a comparison, a less than operator for that so I could sort it. And I found very interesting behavior with stable sorts. There's sort of this oscillation amongst sizes. And, and uh, uh, you know, I have to wonder if, it has, if stable sort is perhaps allocating some sort of back buffer to do work in, and that's what's affecting the sizes here. But I, it's very interesting to see this sawtooth behavior, which was sort of really pronounced in the offset pointer, and then not so, you know, less pronounced in the 2D, in the two-dimensional pointer and not, not really so much of a factor in the other three types. Uh, for string, stable sort, you know, this is sort of a mess. They're all over the place at the, at the lower side of the scale for smaller number of elements. Again, I have no explanation for the behavior. I'm simply reporting what I've observed. And for the test struct, a stable sort. So, I'm, going to, I'm not going to show the results for all the compilers. I'm going to show for the latest compilers, uh, Clang 4, GCC 7.1, and uh, Visual Studio 2017. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, at least for GCC and Clang, the, the, the uh, behavior of the older compilers was very, very similar to that of the latest in this particular set of tests. So GCC behaves differently. The curves have a different shape for GCC. So here's the UNT64 copy test, uh, and you know this is the uh, this is the offset pointer. Don't ask me what's going on there, but there could be a bug in the code. But it was very consistent that it would work so much more quickly. I, I don't get that, and I'm like I'm inclined to think that you know maybe I have a bug in my suite because that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but. It's, it's what I measured. Copy, all right, you know, this makes more sense to me for strings, right? You know, you sort of expect a distribution based on the complexity of the, the underlying pointer implementation. For the test struct, you know, sort of the same behavior we saw at the low side uh, for, uh, for uh, Clang. You know, one theory that I had, and I'm not sure if this makes sense or not, but at the low side, it could be that, you know, all of these elements are fitting into cache. And what I'm seeing at this point, when I get beyond a certain number of elements, is now I'm seeing cache misses. And so the costs of the pointers are being hidden in the cache misses. I don't know, it's just a supposition. Uh, UNT64 sort, this is a nice pretty graph. It's nice and smooth and sort of makes sense. Uh, sorting strings. Uh, no explanation for the bumpiness in that. Uh, surprisingly, given the bumpiness in the string sort, I was surprised to see the smoothness in the graphs for the test struct. And uh, you see similar behaviors for the stable sorts. There's this test struct stable sort. Okay, Visual Studio. Uh, very similar results. There didn't, with Visual Studio, there didn't seem to be as much variation on the low end with the smaller numbers of elements. And the string copy for Visual Studio. Uh, 
uh, copying the test structs, again, sort of converging, everybody converges to the same ratio, sorting unit 64s, sorting strings, sorting the test structs, another pretty graph. But interestingly enough, here at the low number of elements, you know, this is, uh, for the wrapper base pointer, this is sort of the worst ratio that I've seen. I mean, this is almost a ratio of 2 to 1 for 100 elements. And stable sort, test struct stable sort. Okay, so now what I wanted to do is, is this is a multidimensional test space. I wanted to take a slice through the space in a different direction. So I have five official minutes left. I wanted to take a, a slice through the test space in a different dimension. So, and here I picked the, the addressing model that had the worst performance, the biggest spread. So I chose the offset strategy, uh, the offset addressing model. And so what I wanted to do is, for the offset strategy for the sort function of string, how did the compilers compare, right? I'm cutting through the multidimensional space in a different way. So now, I've got sort of an apples to apples comparison of how each compiler compares for that particular operation, for that particular data type, with that particular strategy. So, what we see is that, you know, GCC is pretty consistent. Uh, Clang is actually better in most of the cases that have larger number of elements. And, you know, Visual Studio becomes consistent but kind of lags behind the other two. Uh, similarly, for sorting the test struct, again for Clang and GCC and Visual Studio, here, in this particular case, uh, GCC beats the other two at every single uh, element size. And here I've done the same thing for the stable sort for strings, comparing the compilers. There's the stable sort for test structs. And here, you know, now the performance is, is a little bit closer to each other. So, performance testing takeaway. Usually, I found that offset pointers have the worst performance, and by the way, there were two use cases in, in my tests where I found I, what I believe to be code generation bugs in the older two GCCs. Uh, I found it difficult to predict which addressing model was going to have the best performance in any given circumstance. There was a surprising variation across data types and array sizes. GCC generally had the most consistent performance ratios and usually had the ratios that were closest to one. So that was the synthetic pointer performance testing. And if you will indulge me for about 10 more minutes, we'll get to the allocator awareness results. Okay. So more test framework types. Remember I said before I wanted to test different combinations of the POC types. So I created two more allocator wrappers where I could parameterize whether it was a, a preserve on container copy assignment, on move assignment, swaps, and whether or not the containers compared equal. And I created allocator wrappers that did this for both natural pointers and synthetic pointers. So, I'm trying to get this column in my, in my chart. And this is actually a lot less code and a lot easier to understand. So, here, is the top of my natural pointer allocator. And you can see that I just, you know, uh, the template parameters POCA, POCMA, and POCS are all either stood true type or false type. And I directly created my uh, type aliases using them. Uh, you can see that I'm using natural pointers here. And I'm using, I'm just using stood allocator as my heap. And I have very simple allocate and deallocate functions. I have very simple uh, functions for comparison uh, for equality and inequality. And that actually all fits in one slide. You know, even though stood heap is, is uh, you know, has all of the POC types true and is stateless, that doesn't matter. In this case, I'm using the template parameters to tell the user of this container that those things are false. And I just want to see if something blows up doesn't matter what's under the hood, it's what I tell the container is under the hood, right? So allocate, deallocate. Uh, here, I'm using the template parameter, which is a bool, to return true or false to say, does this allocator, do two instances compare equal? Very simple. 
Very much the same thing with the SINPOC allocator, the same, the same games with the template arguments, except for pointers, I'm using my SINPUTTER types. <coughs> All right. Uh, everything else is virtually the same. Again, very important here, I'm using my, my template parameter to say whether or not two instances compare equal. So, compile and link, run without crashes, hangs, or infinite loops. The synthetic pointer types uh, give me the same answers as ordinary pointers. Uh, test out, these test allocators give me the same results after tests as T, and they support relocation. All tests are in a single thread, and in this case, results are pass or fail. So, I'm going to pick one container, DEC, and show you sort of how it was done. I have simple tests, normal te simple tests, which is a sanity test, normal tests, which run uh, some construction, uh, element insertion, destruction, assignment, swap operations. I have tests that do similar things but attempt to do relocation. And then I have tests that, that exercise the, uh, uh, these combinations of template parameters. And I've used macros to sort of hide that and make things easy to read. So, what is a test? So, just a quick note about relocation and this thing which I called swap segment. Remember, in the two-dimensional view of memory, I've got, I've got my segment backbone and I've got a, sh a shadow segment backbone, my normal segments and my shadow segments. So, what do swap segments do? Well, it mem copies the data from an ordinary segment to a shadow segment and then it swaps the pointers. And that's how I test for relocation. So, after a swap buffer, that's sort of what the picture looks like. So, all right. So, what are the tests that I run? I ran the tests for wrapper strategy and the based two-dimensional strategy for the, for the ordinary tests and the relocation tests. And then I run the, the POC tests with all the different combinations of POCA, POCMA, POX, and equality, uh, comparison equality that makes sense. I'm out of time, so I hope you'll stay around. Just a few more minutes. I'm almost there. Uh, so these were the cases where uh, preserve on container swap was true, and then these were the cases where preserve on container swap was false. And note that if preserve on container swap is false and my allocators compare false, that's undefined behavior. That's the line of undefined behavior that I did not test. I didn't see any point in it. So, how do containers perform, right? This is the money. GCC. So, for my simple tests and normal tests, with synthetic pointers, they all pass. They're great. Every single relocation test fails on GCC across the board. I'll come back to why in a moment. Interestingly enough, for the POC tests on list, they fail as well. They also fail for ordinary pointers. So, why does this column all fail? Because inside GCC containers, they take my synthetic pointer type for all of their internal representation and they turn it to native pointers. And from that point, everything is in terms of native pointers, which means now the benefit you get, the relocatability that you get from a synthetic pointer is now vanished. So I'm not really sure whether this is standard conformant behavior or not. I thought that the standard, I guess that the standard implied that if I'm passing something, a type pointer, that it would be implemented in type of pointer, but I can't find any language that explicitly says that. So maybe they're doing the right thing and I'm expecting too much. Some quick notes, GCC only provides specializations of hash T, not the template, so I had to create my own specialization for basic string that used my allocator. Uh, uh, GCC, yes, uh, the POC tests fail. There are failure cases when pox is true and equal is false. And finally, there was a bug that I found in code generation for uint32 in a couple of cases. That's GCC. Clang, much better. Uh, and I will note, because string is not actually purported to be an allocator-aware container, I did not test it. I didn't run the pox tests on it because 
It's not alleged to be an allocator aware container, so I, I didn't, I decided not to do that. I did find that in list, it's still, Clang list still test pointers for null by comparing to zero. Yes? Is this Clang with lib C++? Yes, or? sorry, I should have, I should have clarified. This is Clang with lib C++, not stood, not lib stood C++. Uh, Clang's basic string implementation does not support the offset addressing model. Because the offset pointer has non-trivial constructors, uh, apparently that conflicts, that is not instantiable by the type of, um, what do they call it, uh, compressed pair that's being used to represent Clang strings. So Clang strings work with all of the, with all of the synthetic pointer types except the offset pointer type. The offset pointer type is the only one that has non-trivial constructors. A little disappointing because the, the uh, 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 Visual Studio actually does. So, Visual Studio 2015, update three. Uh, sort of the same picture. Uh, uh, you know, the synthetic pointer tests all pass. Uh, anything based on an RB tree couldn't support relocation. I talked to, to Stefan about this and he acknowledged that it was a bug and it's, it's fixed in the latest version. And there were just sort of some random fails here. Uh, I don't, haven't looked at the code to figure out why. Uh, interestingly enough, when the map test failed, it got into an infinite loop when I was just trying to iterate over the sequence. And the failure here on the pox tests is not that they failed to run correctly, but they failed to compile. Visual tu Studio 2017, this is the cleanest thing out there. This did it, compiled everything that I threw at it. It didn't always run it the most quickly, but it compiled everything and it ran everything correctly. I'm surprised, I'm very pleasantly surprised by this, and I, and I really have to hand it to the, the guys on their team for doing such a good job at, at implementing this. So, finally, uh, my observations, my humble opinion, allocator awareness should be required for basic string, if it's possible, if there's not actually some logical reason why it's not. No, no, there's no Yes. So the, the, the comment was is it's not a container and that's probably why it was forgotten to add allocator awareness as a requirement. That's also the reason why the source cannot have proper documentation. So the comment was is that uh, the, that's probably why vectors could not have a short vector optimization. Uh, secondly, allocator aware, this is aimed squarely at GCC, allocator aware containers should be required to use whatever allocator pointer is in their implementation so that you can get the benefit of relocation if you want it. So if I had to award medals, uh, being kind of childish here, I would give the gold medal to the Visual Studio 2017, silver to Clang, uh, and really it would have been a tie for Clang except it didn't support offset addressing in basic string. And finally the bronze medal to GCC because they use ordinary pointers in their containers. Finally, um, I'm going to make the PowerPoint, a PDF, and all the source code available very soon up on GitLab, not GitHub. I use GitLab. And I hope to have that up before I go home Saturday afternoon. And please, if somebody else wants to look at the code and play with it and run numbers on a different machine, I would be happy to collaborate and, and look at that data. So uh, that's, it. that's it. So thank you. And. I know we're over, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have just one question. Uh, did you try compiling with dash std equals uh, plus 17 from GCC? Did, so the question was, did I try compiling with std equals uh, with the uh, with C++ 17, with C++ plus 17 support oh. enabled? And the answer to that is no. Everything was compiled at C++ 14 for these tests. G, uh, you would be surprised if GCC... No, I, I would be interested in whether they fixed it. Who, who is they? GCC? The, yeah. Uh, let's, let's see what's up. Okay. Yes, I would too. Uh, any other questions? I've thrown a lot of data and pictures at you and some source code. I, I hope it all made sense and, and it's provided some value. I've,
you know, I'm sort of testing along a different dimension than the testing that John did with his. Uh, I was sort of looking at a different thing related to allocators. It turns out that the, um, the use of the, 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 the template style as opposed to the passing by the, the, the base class, the template style makes the code so painful to deal with compared to the other that there are, there are at least a subset of people that think allocators are horrible things and should go away. But it turns out that if you go to a style that's interoperable, Alistair presented something in his talk, which is phenomenal, which is the biggest pain in the butt is you're trying to use, you're propagating allocators from one thing to the next. You're trying to use C++11 style functional programming. And everybody's like, oh, I can't be bothered with this. And Alistair is suggesting that for the next rendition of, of the standard library, that we'll take all the allocator interfaces out of the library code and we'll annotate them as just the compiler knows how to do it, just do it. And and it, it will it will become something that is painless because there's so much complexity in this. There doesn't need to be. Yes. I just wanted to mention that you know it, it's it's like people say, Well, John, you're not using modern C. No, I'm thinking of 2023. That's what I want to see, where allocators are available if you need them, but they're painless whether you need them or not. Yes. That would be great. So the comment is, John is advocating watch Alistair's talk and especially his proposal at the end about allocators uh, in, a, in an effort to reduce the pain of using allocators as we use them now. It's my book. And, and I guess, you know, uh, you know, based on some of the data you've presented and thinking about Alistair's ideas after his talk, I was a little bit shocked at first because I've been thinking about allocators this way for 23 years now. But I'm sort of starting to come around to the idea that maybe this allocator as a template parameter, maybe this really is too much complexity for the standard library and should be something that people use in, in external libraries to, to have that complexity if they need it. No, no, seriously, this rebind stuff is like, why? Well, I can think of the case where you might need it where you want to do allocations that use synthetic pointers. And if the standard goes to a simpler interface, as you you and Alistair are advocating, and as Alistair himself said, there's no place for fancy pointers in his vision, then if I wanted to use synthetic pointers for doing shared memory database work or encapsulated oh, DOM I messages, I could, I, I could do that with some external facility. Well, you, Maybe I don't need to have the standard supporting that for that, those use cases. But it doesn't need to be template parameters. It could also be another kind, right? It could be it doesn't matter what you use a template parameter or, a, or an abstract base class. That's just a syntactic way of getting the, met, the, the allocator over. I don't understand why you need the types. The type part is the part that I don't get. I just don't, I don't understand why you need to, to, to conflate the allocator and the type. Mm -hmm. The allocator gives you the memory I, just a layer on top. I, I, the type part. I agree with you completely. Uh, the question was uh, about John thinks there's no reason to conflate the allocator or pull the type of the allocator into the type of the object. And actually, I'm in agreement. Uh, I, th I have a slightly different view than you and, allocator, uh, you and Alistair, somewhere in between. I don't think that the allocator should be part of the type signature of the container. Uh, I think that the container should be able to pick allocation policies dynamically, not necessarily statically, using base classes and abstract interface as you've, 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 you you've advocated. That, that's not the biggest point. It's the interoperability that but what I do think, what I've played with in the past, the idea that I've played with in the past is that rather than being parameterized by an allocator, a container is parameterized by a type T and the pointer-like type that you want to use to implement it with. Or something that rep or a set of pointer traits that specify, for this container, I'm using natural pointers. For this container, I'm using synthetic pointers of such and such blah. Yes? So it, it seems like we're arriving at two different layered customization points because as as you I mean I completely agree with you allocators should be dealing in terms of void star and size d and that's it it's like operator new yeah um, it's not the new you know not the new operator it's operator new it's a function call you want some bytes you get some bytes right out. yeah um, it's like now yes and and then the the thing is the whole machinery about how do I now reference this memory that I got from this underlying thing? Um, 
does seem to be like a really valid use case to be able to inject into your containers, but it has nothing to do with how do I get a bunch of bytes I can use. Yes. So the so comment... It's a, but it's a separate customization point. So the comment was is that we seem to be approaching two different uh, customization points um, and the... I'm not going to be able to... Uh, I'm not going to be able to summarize what you've said very well, but uh, two different customization points where the uh, uh, the process for allocating memory is different from the process of, of representing it. Am I am I doing justice to what you've said? Okay. Okay. Any any other questions, gentlemen? All right. Well, I guess we'll call it a day. Thank you very much for coming and for your patience. <laughs>